Matt. What's going on today, sir? Oh, man. Life is beautiful, Chris. What's going on? I've got another oh. great episode. I cannot wait to to get started talking to Tegan. Yeah, we have a, an interesting one. Kind of a wild one. Actually, very eye-opening. Yeah. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Tegan, do you want to introduce yourself and kind of talk why we're here? And, and let's get into it. Sure. Uh, Tegan Broadwater, I'm... Uh... I'm what many would call a renaissance man, although I don't know how great at any of the particular uh, endeavors I am. I grew up as a a musician by profession and made my living doing that until I was close to 30 and then decided to have a kid and cut eight inches of locks off and joined a PD, um, which was obviously a 180 from from being a musician. Uh, And then uh, obviously undercover was my specialty, so I got... I got really into undercover work, uh, working as a, a municipal law enforcement, got into a, an undercover, a deep undercover operation that, that took up two full years where I was assigned to the FBI and infiltrating the Crips. Uh, and after that was over, decided to leave law enforcement early and uh, do something easy like start a company from scratch. So then, <laughs> yeah, yeah it was really easy. you know, and uh, I've done that since, you know, since I've grown this company, I've, I've started coming back around to my creative roots and, you know, I have the podcast and then producing more music again and uh, authored a book called Life in the Fishbowl, which recounts the uh, adventures. And, and Yeah, you know, I, we definitely want to get into the, the, the life in a fishbowl, but I kind of want to start off your musician and then have kind of like a quote unquote midlife crisis or or something to where you're like hey i'm 30 years old let me join the police force right like how did that i mean i'm sure you're really talented in the music industry and it's tough and i get why some people just kind of like hey i need something steady right but when you decided to when you decided to go into the you know the police force like what what happened? Like how- yeah, it, it is kind of weird. It wasn't really about steady work. I mean, they were convinced that that's why I applied, uh, just because of the background. But really, man, I've been I've been touring, and I was with a with a group that got signed at South by Southwest, and we went through all these this personal turmoil. It fell apart, and I had about seventy five private students that I taught when I wasn't on the road, and then I had a kid. Between, between having a child and starting to just get really burnt out on yeah. going from club to club and trying to bring in people to support these cokehead club owners and all this kind of stuff. It was, you know, this is old school. It's back in the day. So, you know, if we had 1,800 people on our mailing list and once a month we were sitting around in our rehearsal studio like, like filling out Kinko's prefabbed mailers and then writing personal notes and licking envelopes and mailing stuff out. And oh, wow. It was, it was a lot of work. I, I, and ever since fourth grade, music was it. I mean, I went to, I went to college for music and studied jazz and everything. And again, it was all about not having a backup plan because I'm really myopic. I, I wouldn't say I'm, you know, fully HDA, ADHD or anything, but I'm super myopic when I get into something. And so that's all I had known. So when I really started feeling the effects of burnout and and had my son, I started really thinking, you know, what am I going to do? And I really, man, I had zero idea. I, I just knew that I wanted out of what I was doing. Uh, and, I, and I tell people today, I'm like, man, there's nothing wrong with changing your mind and, and going in a completely different direction. Oh, no, yeah, no, definitely not. No, for sure. Yeah. I just, I kind of wanted to get into Cause we're going to get into the mindset of, you know, what you did next. Right. But yeah. Well, there's you know, a lot of, go yeah. ahead. We, we were playing a bunch of clubs where cops frequented. Okay. So uh, we had, you know, some of our following were a handful of cops. And when they started learning that I was having some of this trepidation about continuing in the industry, they started really politicking for me to get into the police work, I guess, just because they liked me. I don't know that I necessarily had a skill set that leaned that way, obviously. Uh, but I also had been playing in multicultural bands where I was the minority in most of these gigs too throughout my entire career. It just happened to be that way. So 
really when I finally thought what a cool idea that might be, I think it would be cool to do something else that, that I feel like I have a meaningful impact by nature of a job. That's when I cut locks and I applied at two PDs. Uh, I, had, I, had a, I was teaching lessons in Fort Worth, Texas. And so I applied in Fort Worth and Houston and Fort Worth was the first one to respond and get me through the process. And seven months later, I was jumping out on the street you know, so, uh, yeah, it was a crazy. So situation. how long was it? So how long is it, you know, you get hired by Fort Worth PD and then you go undercover, like what kind of, cause that's what I really want to talk about is the undercover and the stresses and the anxiety is like, you're living pretty much a double life. You know, you mentioned oh, you got absolutely. a kid, you know, like how long was it before? Since day one of getting hired to them coming and bringing you into the office to say, Tegan, you're about to be a crip. Like, let's roll, you know? <laughs> a lot of it really was, was self-motivated. Again, I talk about my myopic mindset. When I decided to go to law enforcement, I dove head first. And all I wanted to do was work undercover. It just seemed to excite me. I felt like I all of my friends were super diverse. I've got, you know, preppy sporty guys over here and i've got you know head smoking section cats over here we're all we're all one big family and i really felt like undercover work would have suited me really well so i you know you everybody hits the street you learn how police work goes you're out in a patrol car so all i did from day one was politic to get me from the area i was assigned to a worse area so that i could learn how to actually fight crime as opposed to yeah. Back in the day, when you you become a police officer because you want to put bad guys in jail. That's that's what you did. So I would rather be out running and gunning where all of the crime is. And so it taught me a lot about the people and the culture. It was putting me right back in the hoods where I was going into rehearsals. Not specifically because when I was a musician, I wasn't in those neighborhoods. But uh, when I was a musician in Houston, I was you know rehearsing down in the wards and everything else. I was the the big standout time at it was nothing so it, it, it was a it was an easy transition into that um and then i i noticed a particular neighborhood that was really violent and they had people essentially held hostage it was a six block by six block area one way in one way out people on the rooftop with radios uh, a no tell motel with hookers in and out of it right outside of the entry. I mean, it was it was a complete mess. And and really, you know, when you talk about poor neighborhoods, you have families that have been there for decades and decades. And, yeah. And they can't just move when these assholes come in at 19, 20, 21, 22 year old kids start gangbanging. Taking over. Yeah, yeah. taking over the yeah, neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. So really, that was the motivation uh, behind it. So we answered so many calls out there. The cops, uh, we actually deemed it the fishbowl because, you know, we always went in too deep because it was, you know, you always needed a backup. And every time you entered, you already knew they were radioing to everyone else that you were there. So it became really difficult to actually make any cases in there because it was so tight knit and so well run by the Crip Network that eventually a city councilman, uh, raised the issue and made a giant stink about how bad the violence was getting down there. And the chief of police said, spare no expense. I want the gang unit, narcotics unit. I want everybody doing uh, random jump outs. I want them writing warrants. I want them pulling everybody over, which again is the old school police tactic. Yeah. They would just hammer everybody. Uh, so I, is- I got a question. How did you get in there? Like what, how did you infiltrate there and become one of them and, and what mindset did you have to go to 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 achieve that yeah yeah so you know to expedite the whole process I, when none of those things worked jump outs you know you're you're running warrants the guys get in and everybody's already gone and there's no dope and there's there's it's all been circumvented by the process i i went to my sergeant and and I also went to an informant two separate meetings and said look i have this idea i think I could go down there and infiltrate. I'll pose as a as a big time dope dealer whose uh, source was busted by the feds. I uh, came up from the Austin area, and I'm working on the west side of town. This was on our east side of town, so I was like, where my game is, where I'm starting to get trying to get more traction again, is on the west side. So I would appear as an opportunity, not competition. And first of all, they left. 
me out of the room because <laughs> bricks, right? You know, so yeah. yeah, the obvious thing, right? Yeah. Uh, I had been I had been experiencing uh, a lot. I've been doing buys and stuff because I again I so myopic. I was really putting myself in a position to make it to the narcotics unit, which once I did, I started taking on things like this. And so it was so to be clear, up. you weren't like a beat cop, like you weren't rolling around in a patrol car and like hey. Sarge, I got this idea. Let me let me bend your ear a little bit and just be like, I want to be a big time kingpin drug dealer from yeah, the, from the west yeah. side, trying to infiltrate the east side, right? Yeah, and the experience started in in patrol because we were in such a bad area. They had funds for people to run warrants on small time dope houses that narcotics didn't have time to deal with, and that's where I got a lot of my experience. I was writing warrants and ever and paying a whole team overtime to stay after shift. We gear up in the, in the old SWAT gear that was handy down and we'd go hit houses and, you know, and, and run warrants. So I was really more experienced by the time I got to this, for sure. I knew what I was doing and, and my, my boss in particular covered my ass, really believed in me because I was, I was just a hard worker and I had a, a very poignant plan and went to my wife and said, look, I want to do this. It's going to be a, a, a big undertaking, but I think, you know, it might be as long as, you know, two or three months and, I got her to buy in, which is really key. Um, affable thing, uh, not only being the white dude I am, but also end up being an 18 month deep undercover operation instead of three. But, uh, you know, as you kind of start peeling layers of that onion and, and find, find success, yeah. you, you kind of keep going. So it ended up being, and, and, you know, people can read it in life in a fishbowl, right? But it ended up not just being in the Fort Worth area, it was also in la correct it, it, this 18th month investigation or deep you know deep cover brought you to the west coast didn't it well i didn't actually have to come out here because uh my top leaders lieutenants and kingpin here were actually from la from okay. the area so they were coming they were taking cats from fort worth driving them out here and visiting with family, learning the trade, the dope trade, the gun trade, and all that kind of stuff, and coming back and organizing. So that was like a boot camp for drug dealing. They'd send them off to boot camp and then come back to the home base, right? <laughs> yeah, kind of. And it's, look, it's pretty organized, but like once you, it's like anything, you, you know, you're in a business and you think it's all glamorous, but then when you see the innards, you're like, wow, this isn't quite as organized as I would have imagined it. Yeah. These guys had every intention of being super organized and everything else, but they're still sociopathic kids. You know, these guys are 23, 24, 25 years old. So yeah, there's only so much really you can expect them to do in terms of their organization. But they were coming out here and learning the trade, and they were obviously having a lot of success there. So I hit up, I hit up a, an informant and said, here's how we're going to penetrate this first thing. So I'm gonna, I, my whole persona was... I was T from the West Side, right? So my even my name, Tegan and T, are pretty close. And I just thought if I were had a little sociopathic element to my personality and I really wanted to see if I could start moving dope and I was determined to do it, how would I actually do it if it were really me? Yeah. So every part of my personality stayed intact. I didn't I didn't really I didn't really change a lot about my personality. People tell you to to dirty your look or you know, wear baggy your clothes or you know mess with your car or what, whichever ways i just thought man uh i'm just going to fit in by standing out and and lean on my reputation and my confidence and what i'm trying to do and and go that way and present myself as an opportunity so what i did was when i brought an informant in the first time i said the informant is going to be the main dude my job is I'm hooking this cat up, so I don't need I don't need you to to ask me nothing because I'm just helping him get his hustle. So we came in there and they started asking all these questions like, "Hey, this is all about him," and and they went through all the questions with him too because they don't just sell to anybody. But you pull up yeah. on your rooms and these people are surrounding your car and you know giving you the what for. So you know, and he's a smooth talker. He gets he gets through his deal and they come out to the window and somebody tries to hand me the stuff. I'm like, again, I'm like, dude. <laughs> I don't want to be touching this shit. This, this isn't my deal. And this is, this is for him. So they go over, hand him the stuff to the window. And then, you know, I, I fork a C note over to him and then he hands it over as if I'm disconnecting from the deal and can't be prosecuted when yeah. ultimately I'm witnessing the whole deal. Right. So I, that was the first kind of deal, uh, 
uh, dealings into it, and I really just went really, really slow to the point where people looked at me like, okay, this guy's supposed to be a kingpin. He's bringing these cats down here, just kind of funding their game. I, I sure would like to sell to him. So a couple of people started giving me the, the 20 questions, and, you know, and I, again. Like, who are you? Like, why are you, why are you trying to be in the shadows? Yeah, exactly. And, oh. and no, no righteous dope is going to answer all those questions anyway. It's like, man, you know, I'm just above your level. You guys are selling hard down here. I'm looking for, you know, powder cocaine, and, you know, I don't, I don't play at these levels and stuff. And so, again, to a small timer, that's that's exciting, and they're like, "Oh, well, I'm a man, but I got all this. I think your people would like this." But oh, I said, "Man, I'll tell you what. I said, you know, give me a C note. Uh, you know, sell me a yard. It was a yard. It was a hundred dollars worth. Like, man, give me a yard. I'll see if I can move it or whatever, and I'll help you out or whatever, you know." And started getting to know people like that. So I had this teeny, teeny little budget. So I've got like fifty ones and. 520s and 100 that I'm taking this giant wad of money out peeling 100 off. I mean, it's really nothing because we have no budget. So I'm buying these little samples and that's essentially what I'm building cases on, but trying to get over there. Because then I say, you know, the third time I go in, I go in trying to seek somebody that I know is not around so that I then have conversations with other people. With the next them. level, yeah. So then I'm like, hey, you know, I got I got four magnums, a four pack of magnums right here. Who wants to get the rest kicked in Madden? So then we go sit around, we start playing Madden, and then, you know, I thought, hell, this is better than than buying a kilo anyway because I kicked the rest at Madden and you got instant street cred, right? Especially, when, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I was just about to say that. No, I mean, we could we could go we could I mean I could speak to you for hours about you know, the, the nuances and, and everything like that. Cause I'm super fascinated by the infiltration aspect of it, but I want to really get into like the, the stress and the anxiety of it. Like, yeah, you start working your way up and you're beating these guys in Madden and you, you know, they start to gain your trust and now you're, you level up, you're getting to know the, the higher players. Right. right. And you're building those cases and you know, you're, you're starting to figure it out. What kind of, I mean, there, there had to have been nights where you didn't see your family or when you were on your way home to go see your family, you had to be checking your rear views, maybe, yeah. you know, kind of swerving and, and, you know, making not the same route to the house. Like yeah. what kind of stress and anxiety came into play for those, the, the, the meat of that 18 months where you were like, I'm close and you know, yeah. I can't, I can't trust anybody, you know, yeah, it was, uh, the level of stress was extraordinary. I will, I will say that, uh, I, I actually started losing hair and all kinds of, I mean, I was, I was the only undercover. I was in control of the operation. The first, uh, maybe 10 months or so was through the PD. So I literally was just going out on my own, calling old dudes in patrol that I knew that I trusted to park up the street because, you know, I didn't want to call a narc unit, take two hours to set up and then have a bunch of white dudes in suburbans sitting within three blocks. Yeah. You never get anything done. Uh, heat runs actually was a, a calm, very common practice in what you described too. You take off from a place and you take a right and you take a right and you take a right. And you take that last right, if you still have a caboose, then you've got a problem, right? Yeah. So, um, I did that, and that was really a, another major conundrum. When you talk about, by the time I even started working through the FBI and taking their resources and then giving me cars and everything, the significant difference is when you look at the Pistones and all these guys that have done these amazing undercover operations, they, they send them to this city that's an hour and a half from their house or five hours from their house, or they move to Florida to do this or that. This was in my own city. So we literally had to have a plan between my wife and I about when I see someone at the mall that I know is going to come up and talk to me, we would just kind of casually kind of walk apart and, and appear as though we were just walking near each other but weren't together. And then I would in, in, engage these people because everywhere you went, you had to worry that you're going to run into somebody. Yeah. It'd be a bad part of town, but everybody goes to the mall. Everybody has to drive to a certain area or goes to a football game or whatever so you see a lot of these people in your normal life and uh one of the times that i was coming home i checked my sticks i did all the stuff i was up i lived about 20 minutes from this particular place where it all launched and i was driving home made made all took all the precautions and then 
out of nowhere, as I'm just kind of vibing and just getting myself decompressed, my black, my back window was, was shot out. Jesus. And so I immediately like steered up into this building and, and took cover behind the building. And then since I was still in my hood mode, I just got pissed, pulled a gun and started flying through the neighborhood with the gun hanging out and like, looking for the son of a bitch that just shot at me. Makes wow. sense. It, it makes sense if you're an idiot. But, you know, obviously I, I was still in that mode and, it, and it, it taught me a lot about where I was compared to where I started. And I need to just one of those, I, of the many, many, many check yourself moments I had in 18 months. That was one. Did you, did you ever find out who shot your back window? No idea, but the, probably the, a good thing. Yeah. Well, the situations that, that, that led to that is what made me freak out because um, I, I could. I would take up your whole podcast telling the entire story, but ultimately I was on cops a couple of times and in like 99, and this was in 2005, six, seven, eight times. So these guys, you know, back in before internet was huge and everyone had 2,600 channels, there were three stations and every bastard in jail watched cops. And I don't know if you guys remember, or if you're even old enough to remember, uh, but Fort Worth cops was, 60 percent of the cops episode. yeah it was it was staple yeah yeah no it was a staple yeah so i was i was inside a house with a locked burglar bar cage with a with a, a pistol and a stack of dope and weighing up a purchase when my ugly mug dressed in a cop's uniform came on the tv behind me while i stood facing a shotgun style house couch coffee table TV, I'm standing in front of the TV and I hear my own voice come on the television. Again, it's one in a trillion now. It would seem like one in a million then, but again, with three channels, yeah. choices, everybody has that sucker on. It's just running. Everybody has a TV and a couch and a place to cut dope and maybe a Bible and corn. That's how you know that you're sick. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that was the most terrifying moment uh, of my experience. I had guns pulled on me. We've been in all kinds of traumatic situations that I can prepare for because I think they draw down on me. I'm going to do this. They try to search me. I got this. I got it all under control. And that I didn't have under control. And when I absolutely filibustered, couldn't even remember what I was saying, but I was trying to talk over the TV and yeah. the guys doing the deal was looking at me like, man, you're freaking weird. What's up with you? And I left and just hauled ass out of there. And the guy that was with me was like, man, what's your deal? T, what's up? And I was like, man, you don't know. And he, he had no idea. But it freaked me out because I thought, man, this is absurd to such an extent that I don't, I'm not going to know when someone has seen that. And every time I get introduced to someone else, I run the risk of being discovered immediately. Because of yeah, that. because they, you don't know if they're watching one of the three channels. Like, oh, wow. Wow. Not what coping mechanism, like how do you cope with that fear and, and anxiety? Like, what did you do to get away from that? Because I know that would eat me up inside. That shit would ruin me. Well, most of the things that I overcame were overcome by the fact that I had gotten so far. I'd already jumped out of the airplane. I either had to figure out the parachute or not. So that really was kind of my mindset. There was, I mean, you would have had to basically pull me over a vast, uh, vat of acid and say, you know, drop it in three seconds, decide to quit or not for me to quit. Because I, I was making so much progress and I was so bound and determined to get the head of the snake that you couldn't stop me from doing it. Uh, the, the stress lingered, you know, the, the caution lingered. And I had a situation where, you know, one of the biggest challenges is going from, okay, now I've established a relationship with you. Me and Matt are our homeboys. You know, I'm, I'm spending some money with him, you know. Hey, I just, uh, I, the kilo back then was going for about 17 grand for a, for a white dude from South Texas. And so I'm spending money with you. But, my goal isn't to, to make this a dope case. This was a gang case. I'm trying to get rid of gang members. This isn't just like a dope case. Yeah. So my goal, as soon as you and I start making deals, my goal is to figure out how to get away from you and go to one of your partners who's also an associate and is a grip without making you want to shoot me in the face. Yeah. <laughs> like you're just using yeah. me to get to my, yeah. So, because uh, if you go too fast, then there's flags that are 
<laughs> set like why is he trying to escalate so fast and, and get to the head yeah. of the snake right so yeah, yeah. So that was that was something man, i would i would use things that i use today which is you know you try to do business with somebody and they're constantly late or they're they break promises here and there well in the dope game when you're dealing with a bunch of mid-20s dudes that think they're hot shit and they're you know moving keys or whatever happens all the time uh, they would call it are you doing it on time are you doing it on doper time those were the two different things so i would usually leverage that like man i'm pulling up in a bend in the hood and parking in front of your house and waiting for 25 minutes do you realize how risky that is do you, re- do you realize how disrespectful of my time that is and i would leverage that to move on and and leading up to these situations where then i was concerned about who had seen cops and who was going to out me I started, uh, I had one guy that actually put a jacket on me, which is labeled me as a snitch. And we were really unsure why he did it. Although I was pretty sure that he did it because again, I moved from him to a dude right around the corner. That was one of his partners Yeah, and it pissed him off so bad that he started, he launched that. So I, I went to one of my, uh, my big leaders that I was tight with at the time, right back to him and said, Hey man, I'm just letting you know I got a problem with your homeboy and you know he's he put a jacket on me and I just I just want to give you a courtesy call because uh, I don't play like that and I just I don't want to step on your game hoping that he would nip it that you know because by this time I don't even need informants bad guys are about to inform me to other bad guys so I'm going yeah to the you're already in there and one of your underlings over here is giving me a hard time he was laughing like my oh, man see, he don't know what he's doing it and 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 his words were. You do what you got to do. I got you. And so I was like, oh, dang. I was kind of hoping you would do something about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I went to bed that night with a plan. I already knew the deal. My 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 dude makes a drop at the at the foot of one of the carports in one of his, his spots. He drops a key down there every morning around 8 a.m. And so I just, I just got up super early and parked out in front of his house. And when he pulled up, uh, I made a beeline on on foot straight for him and beat the shit out of him. And that's that's the way I said, okay. That's what that was one of the pivotal moments where I said, okay, I'm risking my job, but if I don't do something, when somebody in the street calls you a snitch and you're in this game, yeah, that's a giant deal. Yeah. And- you're risking your job, but he's risking your life, you know. Absolutely. So it, yeah, had to do that. Yeah. yeah, so that, that's what you have to discern. So my decision was, man, I'll put this all at risk because I already have this giant case. And like I explained, almost nothing was going to stop me from completing it. I wasn't trying to do illegal things or you know break laws and do whatever. I'm still trying to play by the rules. But yeah, it was no. I, I tried to do what I could to stay responsible to this, but in order for this to continue, what would a gangster do to somebody who labeled him as a snitch? Yeah, you got to play the part. Like, that's yeah. what so he was like, hey, T, what's up? And, it's, you know, trying to play it off. And, and uh, you know, so I just went to town on him and thought, this is this is how it gets handled. I didn't hear anything else. But again, all those little things uh, spattered through time kept kept me freaking I'm out. Sure that, I'm sure the anxiety was just off the, uh, I mean, me <laughs> owning there. my own, you know, company um, and, and dealing with everything that, and we'll get into what, you're doing now but there are stresses that come with that right a lot, i couldn't yeah. even imagine and my life is not on the line but there's still stresses i couldn't even imagine what you're dealing with internally to where you don't want to scare your wife or you don't want to you know ruin your relationship with your son but you also have this goal and this mission to take these people off of the streets right and, and to complete the the assignment yeah. just I, oh man, I couldn't. You're a better person than I am because no, yeah, I, was, I, I couldn't do it. I, I knew I, I know I couldn't do it. Well, I, I also, I, I think often about you know people ask if I regret it or or would I do it again, and, and I said so. There's there's different ways to think about it. I I think if someone had told me up front what I was going to encounter, I may have had a lot of second thoughts. But yeah. part of the beauty of it is you never know when you're going. And it is the same as when you start a business. Yes, there's different levels of risk that you're taking, but your well-being, your your familial security, your everything. When you're starting a business, people have 
zero appreciation for the amount of time and effort and lost sleep and yep. doing every little aspect. People have zero respect for that. So I did find similarities in that in starting a company from nowhere and trying to drive it up. It is different when you are trying to mitigate, like, how much is my family going to be exposed here? Uh, you know, there was guys that were like, tell me where you live, you know, in order to, you know, to, to get me to prove certain things or whatever, which, you know, obviously I wouldn't do, but I I knew where they were going with, with those conversations. So it, it definitely was an inordinate amount of stress that I wow. You went from so, a musician to a rock star because that's exactly what you are. Kind of rock star. You are like, and then, and we're running short on time, but what are you doing now? Like kind of, kind of get into what you're doing now. You've transitioned, you wrote this book, life in the fishbowl. You can find yeah. it on Amazon or teganbroadwater.com and all the, all the proceeds go to uh, you donate. Correct. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I, people would encourage me to write the book. Once this came out and it became this big deal, uh, then everyone wanted me to write a book. And I'm like, I, I have no reason to write a book until we started really going over the numbers and you know they were asking for statistics and the rest and all these different things. Well, one of the things when we started debriefing everyone that we realized is there are, we arrested at the roundup. We took you know 200 plus law enforcement rounded up 51. Crips and they all did prison time. 41 of them were sentenced federally and 10 were sentenced uh, in, in the state of Texas. And there were 104 kids left without a parent. And that inspired me to write the book. So all of the profits from the book go to charities that mentor children of incarcerated parents. Because ultimately, the arrests are only a little piece of the solution when you're trying to, to, to solve the cycles of violence that happen in these poor neighborhoods. So you've got to get the kids to learn better ways to tackle life and to, to learn how to overcome adversity and to learn special skills and things like that. So a lot of these operations do just that. And that's why I pushed the book. Um, and then, you know, I left law enforcement early. I mean, to your point, the amount of stress was so ridiculous. I knew there was no way to support a marriage and a, and a reasonable lifestyle. So we started a company, which is kind of laughable too, because again, I didn't know what I was getting into, but again, I get my optics. Started a Tactical Systems Network, which is a, an armed security and protection firm. Uh, we do lots of consulting and stuff, vulnerability assessments and things like that. Uh, I started that in 2008, about three months before the stock market crash. And so yeah. uh, we're still in business to this day, so it's great, it's been very successful. And uh, since then, if, if, uh, also launched uh, another Uncommon Souls where we we're doing lots of interviews with interesting people and trying to share stories that normally people from different walks would not listen to. But yeah. in the community, everybody's really interested in hearing stories from everybody from, you know, people that have been wrongly convicted for murder to Pablo Escobar's kid to, you know, musicians to whatever. It kind of runs the gambit and, and kind of puts a lot of similarities to, to outline the fact that we are so much alike. And uh, back to music and doing lots of musical collaborations and stuff like that. So we're really, really looking to get back uh, all my my creative chops to right now these days. I love that. And Uncommon Souls is the podcast, right? And can be found where? Uncommon Souls is the YouTube channel, and okay. it's uh, it's the Tcast on Uncommon Souls. That's where you can find it. Um, that's where you can find it on YouTube. It's the easiest way. Or TikiBroadwater.com will show you where the company is, the book, the tree. music. Yeah. The but all that stuff is right there too. It's T-E-G-A-N broadwater.com. Super easy to find. I just got one more question. Go, go, yeah, ahead, go, go ahead, Matt. I'll ask after you. Go ahead. With your security company now since 2008 and, and the arrest, when you, did you have to testify when they were doing? So how was it when you walked in the room and these guys that you kind of, and they befriended you, what was their like? Obviously, they weren't pleased, but it ran the gamut. It, it, I had guys that I had guys that gave me birds and said, "I don't want to ever talk to this cat." And they wouldn't talk. I had people that uh, that cooperated, but still thought of me as T. So I would sit, you know, since I was working with the FBI, I had FBI agent and me, and then across the table was was the perp. Again, this is a guy I've known for a long time, so I really have an, an an affinity towards this person. I'm rooting for him. So I'm saying, man, really help us out. Like give us yeah. the information. 
because I don't want to see you go away for a long time. And these sentences ended up being really long. But, you know, the FBI agent was berating one guy one time. He's like, I know you did it. You talked to Bird, and I know you've given it to da 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 And he's like, no, it's not true. T. Teller, it's not the this name true. T. Teller. And, and I was sitting there just thinking, man, you're crushing my soul, dude, because I know you did it because I was there. And, and you're staring at me, and I'm on the side of the other table. I, I, man, I just really want you to cooperate because, again, I, I knew that I was going to help them. And I actually went and testified on behalf of two of the people as to their character in order to get their time down. Reduced. Yeah. I them. However, so many of them had the experience. I could not blame them because in my mind, I know who I really liked and who I really wanted to go away. But I couldn't control the lack of trust once I came out as T and yeah. T. So a lot of those guys that I pleaded with, like, man, please, man, you, you and I had this thing going. Trust me, blah blah blah. I don't blame them for not trusting me, man. Just yeah. Just, and yeah. do you do you now walk around with armed guards like from your own <laughs> private security because uh, repercussions that might happen? And I'm not trying to put that out there, but you know, no. like, that's a yeah. real thing. Most of the threats came when the arrests happened. A lot of the family members and and guys from from prison, and we did a lot of extraordinary things to protect ourselves. We still do a lot of ex extraordinary things to protect ourselves. But these guys now that are that are starting to to funnel out of the prison system um, also realize that it's not personal. The the fact that now I'm, I have an opportunity to speak to places like this where they understand I, I really am rooting for them. Some of them are pen pals and I write them all the time and we still communicate to this day. Some of the guys that are in there still, I'm actually politicking to get out and working with uh, the prosecutors and judges to try to get their sentences cut short uh, because they were huge sentences and I couldn't control who got what. So yeah. when I saw people that I really thought had the character to, to make a life out of what they had, and I see them still in, and I try to work to get them out. I think overall, the fact that we tell them telling the story in order to paint a picture that that says, "Look, I'm not a superhero. This was a real life story, and this I had real life relationships, and you know, I I went through a lot of strife over this decision to do this, and I'm also realizing that arresting people isn't the isn't the end of the game. It's only a piece of it, and I'm yeah. You know, Donating to these charities, we've helped some of their actual kids out during holidays and set up parties and funding wherever we can. They know that that my uh, intentions are noble, and and it wasn't a personal thing. But I I ended up taking it personally to the extent that I actually don't judge these guys at all. There was a sociopathic element in them, but otherwise, man, when we were just hanging out and playing Madden, all we did was talk crap about our football teams and who's going to do this. Yeah. Crap. There was, a, yeah. there was a friendship. Yeah. On the West Side, I mean, they're dudes. So that's my message really is that everybody, you know, everybody thinks that, you know, there are different uh, racial and cultural backgrounds that people need to become more familiar with. But no one likes criminals, especially yeah. violent criminals. And in this particular instance, I learned that even violent criminals can have really interesting personalities and have a lot to offer the world if we can figure out how – take those kids that they left behind and keep them from becoming who their parents were. Yeah. That's yeah, a fascinating absolutely. story, Tegan. That's yeah, that's insane. Yeah. So part, part of my question you kind of already went into is growing these relationships and, and becoming friends with these people and then turning around and, you know, ending up the end point of the investigation, them going to jail and them finding out, did that mess with your mental health and your thought process? Like, how, how did that? Because, I mean, if if I became a friend with someone, regardless of being an under, undercover or not, like, there's still a friend. There's a connection there. Yeah, it was devastating. I mean, it was, it was surprisingly devastating. It, there was, at the same time that the one amount of stress left and the, uh, you know, just, I, I felt like I could almost breathe at the same time, just a new level of stress was here. Because again, I, I was trapped in my mind. Like, dude, I'm looking at you and having this conversation. We've talked a million other times before, and you believe me, and I've backed it up. I'm just telling you, my plan is you are one of the unique individuals that I want to be able to help. And the only ones that really kind of conceded into that was once I started testifying for others, 
the ones that were still less in line were interested in coming back like, hey, uh, I'm calling my attorney. I'd, I'd actually like to talk and figure out something because they, they saw yeah. how to that. But by then, most people had bled out. I mean, out of the 51 arrests we had, we only had seven trials. So, you um, know, I mean, it, and I, I'd done direct deals with all these people. It's kind of hard, yeah. hard to fight. You know? And I don't want to ruin the book, but did you get to the head of the snake? Did you get to yeah. the top guy? Yeah, I did. I got to the top guy in, in the crypt network there, yes. And uh, and that, the, the book essentially outlines my plight to try to take that one person down. And that's, you know, it's it's real life. Again, it's it's it, I find it interesting. And I, I think other people have also, but it really isn't about, you know, elevating me into a Batman kind of a status. It really is true life scenarios. Yeah. And, and you you feel like you kind of have some empathy for some of the guys that are in the story, and that's kind of the purpose behind it. You know, I really want people to, to understand that sometimes you sort of root for the bad guy, but you also root for them to just stop what they're doing so that they can, you know, get away from the yeah. bad guy. And that's the way I felt the whole time. I was like, that's man, an amazing man. story, yeah. Tegan. That's an amazing. Yeah. I'm so man. So I got one more question and, and I don't mean to interrupt you, Matt, but I, I know we're coming close to time, but so from the start of this and the end of this, how is it, how is being involved in this change your perspective of mental health, substance use, and even uh, drug dealing? So at the beginning, you had a certain perspective going through all this, you probably have a different perspective. How has that changed? Um, it's interesting. So the lower level cats that I started in on were usually using and selling, which is why they weren't ever sure there. Have it. Right. Cause you know, you're going to go bring bricks of dope into the neighborhood and you, and you use Coke, you're not going to be very reliable. Yeah. So these other guys were at a different level and they stayed fairly clean. Uh, but I've seen a lot of devastation from the actual drug use. I mean, the, the whole community over there is fairly dilapidated. Not anymore, notably. Um, it's it's definitely doing a lot better. But it, it's it's it was really interesting to see the underbelly of it all. And I wasn't the only one suffering from mental health issues. I mean, these folks out here feel like this is their ceiling. You know, they feel like man, I'm in eighth grade and all my, my buddies are you know, joining games and they got all this success, whatever, however that looks like. But to an eighth grader, I mean, you can't expect a level of maturity and perspective. So these guys are really just following what their best friends do and they see the product best of their environment. Yeah. And man, so the level of anxiety too, when you're out there constantly watching your back from these fools that are going to shoot you or having a, a amount of responsibility to have this sack that has to get sold by a certain time. These yeah. guys were, were bullied into being good business people also. So even when in success, it just bought them another day and didn't get their ass kicked because they weren't doing good enough. And, you know, and then, and then the prostitutes are just like a footnote, which is a whole nother society of people and, and mental health world. So, you know, there was there was a lot of that that I that I got to witness, and I really do think that taking kids at an early age is really the key. Educating them on what they're capable of, uh, making them self aware of you know when they have an issue, uh, how to how to cope with it, and actually cope with it. I think it's the stigma's kind of going away, even in some yeah. of those. So ultimately, I think that's how we kind of refresh society whether they stay poor or not, if they learn how to deal with some of those issues properly at an earlier age, I think we'll have a lot more of a successful society. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree with that completely. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Tegan Broadwater, you are one of the most fascinating men I've ever had the pleasure absolutely. of speaking with and talking to. And it, it definitely I'm, I'm thankful that I have your phone number in my, uh, in my contact list. But I will definitely check that if my phone is tapped now. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. Neither I'm one kidding. of us are important enough. Trust me. <laughs> so TeganBroadwater.com, yeah, yeah, um, all proceeds are donated to a couple of charities that help um, the youth with um, incarcerated parents. Um, you can find the book on Amazon. And um, or you can go to the link tree on TeganBroadwater.com and it tells you where all your information is. So 
And we'll put a link somewhere in the description of this episode as well yeah. so they can go straight there. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate yeah, that. absolutely. It's an honor to be on with you guys. I appreciate what you're doing too. So, uh, you know, keep the faith and reach out anytime I can do anything to help you guys. Let me know. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Till next week, guys. We'll see you soon. See you next week, everyone.